I'd uh, like to welcome everybody to our second PMA capacity building webinar. Um, thank you for joining us. This session is recorded. Um, so let's get cracking. My name is Taryn Edwards. I am honored to be the chairperson of the Personal Managers Association. I have been an agent for the last 18 years. I've been asked to tell you a little bit about the Personal Managers Association, and it's very relevant to today's topic because we're talking about how to start your own talent agency. The Personal Man Managers Association was started in 1980, shortly after the advent of television in South Africa. Um, before that, agents had been looking after actors who were mainly in theater. But with the advent of television, it became tricky and then voiceovers. So the agents in those days who were legends like Munin Lee, Sybil Sands, Penny Charteris, Nolene uh, Leslie started the Personal Managers Association. So it is a membership driven association of agents, we call ourselves talent or acting agents, who facilitate best ethical practice, cooperation and communication among agents and managers. Um, we hold a culture of inclusivity and cooperation, and we strive to implement best industry practices. I believe that my internet's breaking up a little bit, so I'm going to take care of that. Just to say that PMA members volunteer their time, their skills, and their services to support each other. We work in various committees, we share our knowledge, and we support each other in order to empower agents to build their capacity and to improve our professional landscape. We have a website, www.thepma.co.za. Please get in touch with us if you have any questions. With that, I'm gonna jump to my next introduction, which is the introduction of Lee Duru. I'm delighted to introduce you to Lee Duru. She is an actress, an Algoa FM breakfast show co-presenter. She's a news and features journalist and, and uh, does communications and marketing as a specialist. She is a marketing, she has been a marketing executive and a senior consultant on change and implementation. She's also been a communications manager and luckily, luckily for the PMA, she is uh, the administrator of our PMA capacity building project funded by the South African Screen Sector Support Initiative, and she is based in Quebecha, Port Elizabeth. Over to you, Lee. Thank you so much, Taryn. And for the record, I'm the lucky one, really, really proud of the association with the PMA. Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the Setting Up an Actors Agency from an Accounting Perspective workshop. Very excited. This is the second webinar in a series of capacity building uh, workshops from the PMA, as Taryn mentioned. I'm just going to run through the etiquette very quickly, just the Zoom etiquette, um, the house rules. So no mention of where the toilets are in the room. That's where we are now. <laughs> it's all virtual. Um, please keep your mics on mute. You may keep your cameras on if you so wish. And then very importantly, I'm going to be sharing a survey link throughout the workshop. If you would please copy that link um, save it and then after the workshop, if you wouldn't mind completing that very quick, it's about 15 simple uh, multi-choice questions with a few for comments, so it wouldn't take too long. Um, and if I could just suggest completing it straight after the workshop while, uh, you know, your thoughts are still fresh in the mind. And then Q&A, we'll have a Q&A session right after Crystal's presentation, um, at which point I'm then going to ask you to raise your virtual hands and we will then um, identify whoever the, 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 the person is who's to ask the question and at which point you'll unmute your mic and ask the question. If we're not able to get through all of those, Christelle has um, said that she would provide her email address and you can email you know, any other questions directly to her. Otherwise, questions pertaining to the PMA can be directed to me 
My email address is lee.duhu at gmail.com. Um, it's L-E-E dot D-U-R-U at gmail.com. I will share it in the chats as well throughout the workshop um, also. And then the recording, as Taryn mentioned, we are recording the workshop. That recording will be available on the PMA and the SA Guild of Actors website after the workshop, approximately uh, in a week's time. And Christelle's uh, soft copy presentation will also be up there. So, yeah, with that said, those are the etiquette of the house rules. And please do enjoy. We're looking forward to hearing everything you've got to say, Christelle. Thank you. I'm going to introduce Christelle. So I am going to post it in the chat in case I break up too much. Um, I have the pleasure from the PMA to introduce Christelle Fulyun. She's the co-owner and operational director of MGL Accounting. She is registered with both the South African Institute of Tax Practitioners and the South African Institute of Business Accountants. And as a general tax practitioner and a business accountant in practice, uh, as well as holding SAIBA license to conduct independent review. Having completed her BCOMP degree in 2010 and her honors in BCOMP in 2012, her five year articles were done at small to medium sized auditing and accounting firms where she was exposed to various businesses. She has worked in the SME entrepreneurial sector as well as corporate commerce as accountant, tax specialist, and financial manager. But she soon realized, I think to the benefit of her clients, that she missed the variety that an accountant practice, accounting practice offices and the scope of clients that are dealt with. And I think, uh, Crystal, you'll tell us more about your clients, but I'm sure they are varied and colorful and they do interesting things. Absolutely. So, uh, Crystal has worked in the TV and film and theater industry th since 2005 and not only understands the in industry, but enjoys working with it. Her business partner and managing director of MGL Accounting, Margie Lagerwall, is joining us um, a bit later. And she's also had great exposure in the industry during the 35 years that she's been in practice. Currently, the agency and these are acting agents or talent agent clients include Artist Connection, Viclectic Artist Management, Elysian Management and Fourth Wall Management. MGL accounting attend to a variety of actors as well and other independent artists, personal taxes, as well as accounting work for their other businesses, thereby ensuring that their whole tax situation is dealt with by one person or one firm. They also do production accounting and cost reporting for the SABC and MNET for I Am Unlimited and Dynamic Vision Productions. Thank you very much, Crystal and Margie, for giving us your time this afternoon. And over to you. Hi, Taryn. Hi, guys. Thank you very much for having us. So um, it's an honor for us to also be, um, can I say, recognized and um, to have our inputs and to see that there's so many of you is actually interested and in getting it right and um, doing things the right way the first time around, if we can put it that way. <laughs> so we come across so many people who have had their businesses for many, many years and um, who's just so knee deep into so many trouble that, um, yeah, it's good to see the guys up front to one who wants to know what's happening and how to deal with the situation. Um, also, just from my side, I am a Burki, so my English is not <laughs> very delicious. <laughs> so just please forgive the grammar and the, uh, the funny words that I come up with every now and then my brain just switches off. So sorry about that. Okay. Then, um, so let, let's get into it. There's quite a bit to, to deal with today. Um, let me just get the technical side of this done correctly. Um, this one. Not that one. Is it this one? Sorry, are you guys seeing the slides? Yes, perfectly. Is it? Okay, yes, so you guys are happy there. All right, 100%. All right, so this is just the introductory page. Let me just get my slides up. All right, so before we get started with all the nitty gritties, um, there's just a couple of keywords that I want to deal with. Um, because um, an accountant, accounting and tax have got their own little shorthand that we refer to. And a lot of time people are like, sorry, what are you referring to? You know, so AFS or financial statements, 
Um, it's a document that is usually prepared at the end of the year to give you an indication of what your business have done, all right? Um, it is used by your investors, your shareholders, your bank, and to basically judge how your company is doing and what it's worth and if there's a tax liability, are you profitable, et cetera, okay? CIPC is the Company and Intellectual Property Commission, and they are the people who you register your company with and who holds it on file. And then um, if you cease to be in operation, they will also deregister you. A shareholder is a person who holds shares in a company. A company is a separate juristic vehicle, and um, we need somebody to um, basically hold the assets. So eventually, who's the ultimate owner of that um, that asset? And that would be the shareholder. But um, it's a bit more technical than that. So um, you basically, you're entitled to, to dividends um, and then also to vote what happens with a company. All right. So any decisions that need to be made, et cetera. A director is a business, is a person that manages the company. It has, it's an actual job title and this is a serious position. Um, in the Company Act, there's actually um, quite a lot of responsibility assigned to directors to, um, to properly govern a company correctly. So that's a serious job. And I don't think people realize every, any time, you know, or all the time, exactly how much responsibility they do take when they sign that little piece of paper. So, yeah. Then a financial year. Um, when you register your company with CIPC, um, it, uh, uh, they will usually ask you for your financial year end. And this is usually um, when you want your financial year to come to an end. So um, there's a 12-month period that you need to account for for financial and tax purposes, and you can decide when that comes to an end. It's not necessarily January to December. Most of the time, it's actually running from March till the end of February. That coincides the best with SARS's deadlines. Um, like you'll see, the next definition is a tax year. So that's the 12 months preceding to the year mentioned. So if I tell you we're in the 2022 tax year at the moment, it means that it's running from the 1st of March 2021 up until the end of Feb 2022. Then your memorandum of incorporation. When you register your company with CIPC, there's um, quite a thick um, document that comes with it that will tell you what is the do's and the don'ts. How many directors? What do you need for a vote? Um, what can you do? Can you distribute profits? Can't you? Those kind of things. And that is called your memorandum of incorporation. Um, you only get issued that MOI once when the company is registered and people tend to lose it. And it makes our job a bit dif difficult. So if you have it, um, please keep it. Um, also nowadays with um, the Companies Act in 20, 20, 2018, yeah, being um, amended, they've tried to simplify a lot of things. So you can now actually have a generic MOI when you register a company. Then um, something that you might come across is called a public inter interest score. Um, we'll get to that in a second when we talk about the different entities that you can register. A lot of people um, from the old companies act are still, no, 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 I don't want a company. I want a CC because I don't want to be audited. This has been changed with a with a new company act where um, if your public interest score is under 100, you don't need to be audited. So just so that you know how it's determined is you get one point for every one, a uh, one million rand in turnover. 1 million rand in debt for every employee and for every third party debt that's over a million. So to get to 100 is quite a bit of business that you've got to do in a year. Okay. Um, an independent review is then if your PI score falls between 100 and 350, it's like a small audit that you need to get done. And an audit is when your PR score is over 350. And those will be your APSA banks, your SASOLs, your, your really big companies who need to have an independent auditor assigned to them and sign off the financials. It's a very detailed process and there's a lot of um, accountability assigned to that as well. And then the, um, the last one that I do have on here is VAT, Value Added Tax. And just so everybody knows that this is different from income tax, but we'll be dealing with the different taxes as well throughout the, the presentation. So um, just a, a heads up that there's different taxes and that it's not the same as income tax. Okay. All right. So let's get into the, the big swing of things. 
sorry, I talk a lot. <laughs> so when you first start out and you want to do your um, your new business, what are your options? What entities is um, available for you to actually make use of? And it's mainly three that's available and, and actually only two of them are really applicable. The first one that you can do, and it's the cheapest out of the three, but it carries the most risk and it's got the highest tax implications, is you can literally run a business in your personal name. So me as Christelle can say that it's Christelle for Luna Accounting. And I bill in my personal name for fees coming to me, but I will also be paying tax in my personal name, all right? And then if anything happens, all right, um, my company goes bad or there's a debtor that needs to, that doesn't pay me or my creditors are beyond control or anything like that, they will sue and come after my personal assets. So you don't have any protection to say that, but you know what, this is a, this was a business deal. And, um, you know, my, my personal house or my car or something, um, shouldn't be affected by it. And um, that's the problem with being a sole proprietor. Like I say, the, the risks are huge. And um, also, the, at the moment you start making money, um, you know, you don't have much um, tax breaks or Corporations, um, they don't, they no longer exist, meaning that, um, you can't go to CIPC and ask for a closed corporation to be registered. But if you are currently trading with a CC, okay, um, they will be governed the same way as a PTY is being governed and they can still be used. But, um, we, we know at some stage that they will have to be formally converted to a PTY with the correct documents and whatever with CIPC. But, um, we don't know the date yet. Um, it's been extended twice, I think. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Then, so that basically leaves us in the best possible situation for you guys with a PTY limited. Okay. Um, just so you know, a limited company is a company that trades on the JSE. So you can't offer your shares to the public. You have to be listed and all kinds of jump through various hoops. But um, a private company or a PTY limited is basically what all of you should um, look at doing. Okay. So like I mentioned before, the moment that your PR score is below 350 and below 100, um, all of that necessary audits and funny stuff falls away. The only thing that the Company Act requires is that you keep um, accurate and adequate financial records. And um, for SARS and CRPC um, purposes, that usually involves annual financial statements. Okay. All right. So what does that entail? And now I've got a PTY registered with CIPC. There's an annual fee that is due on the anniversary of my registration with CIPC. And if my turnover is below a million rand, that's a hundred bucks a year. So that's not too bad. Um, between a million rand and um, 10 million rand, it's 450 rand. I can, however, warn you that if you're late with that, that's a 50, a 50 rand penalty and then they tend to stack up. So if you get that reminder, go in and pay your hundred bucks. <laughs> okay. So yeah. Um, yeah. When you're registering your company, um, this is, this is now, um, taken from a point of view that you have decided to do it yourself and not to make use of an accountant to do it for you. You can do it. Okay. It's not, there's nothing that says that you have to pay an accountant to do this. You can go on to CRPC and do it yourself. Um, make sure that you pick the correct financial year in because if you don't know what you're talking about that's why i um i mentioned the keyword as a financial year in earlier there um make sure that you know what financial period to pick like i say i would suggest strongly suggest that you pick the end of february just because it makes everybody's life so much easier okay um we can register it yourself remember to keep your memorandum of incorporation um like I say, for your accountant's details and for your financial statements to be drawn up correctly, that's just some technical details that they will need. Okay. And then very important to note, if your annual return is not submitted for three years in a row, your company goes into automatic deregistration. And to get it out of that, that's quite a process. Okay. But also remember that until that company is deregistered, so let's say, for instance, you've now decided that this is not for you and you do not want to make use of this company anymore, up until that deregistration process has run its course, you are still liable and you have a statutory duty to still file tax returns for that entity, even if it says null. 
Okay, so just know that it comes with a bit of admin and you need to keep it up to date. Otherwise, there's admin penalties and all kinds of lovely stuff from SARS. Okay. All right, so next up, let's talk a bit about bank accounts. Guys, it is imperative that you realize that a company is a separate entity from you. A company has it's got, got its own name, it's got a company registration number, it's got its own tax number. It is seen as a separate entity from you. And like I said before, um, if anything were to happen, let's say, for instance, you sign a contract for, a, what do you call these? Um, cell phone? No, not a cell phone, a, a, a bigger one. Computer? <laughs> Switchboard. <laughs> Switchboard. That's the word I'm looking for. Sorry. <laughs> Here we go. Um, let's say, for instance, that you sign a, a contract for a switchboard, but the switchboard isn't working or whatnot or whatnot, and there's a big dispute happening, and now suddenly you're indebted for 5,000 rand or something. They will sue the company, okay, if the company signs a contract and not you personally. So just to know that it's, it's two separate entities. And for that same reason, that's why we need a bank account in the company name. All right. You need to split your personal and your company expenses. You can't just use your company as your personal piggy bank. You can't use it to pay your kids' school fees or to buy yourself new tackies or, you know, to have your hair done or have some fun and whatnot. Certain expenses where um, um, are legit business expenses and those you can definitely pay through the business. But like I say, not just anything. Um, you pay yourself a salary from your company and you live on your own money. Okay. All right, so where do we go? Which bank do we use? All right, um, just from knowing what banks charge out there and from what they do, um, Capitec is the cheapest bank, but Capitec doesn't offer business accounts. They only offer individual accounts. Um, second to that, F&B is a great and a cheap bank. They've got very nice and cheap um, business packages that you can make use of. Um, they offer everything for your business need. If you need separate logins, online banking, overdrafts, credit cards, business financing, all kinds of stuff. And the fees are very reasonable. Um, the moment you move on to the net banks, the standard banks, the apps, the fees become really ridiculous. I've had clients who have saved lots and lots of money just by switching banks. So um, be careful. Have a look around and shop around a bit before you just open up a bank account. Um, sometimes it's convenient if you, for instance, bank with Standard Bank to just go to your same bank and just open up a bank account there. By all means, there's nothing wrong with it. You are allowed to bank anywhere, any bus any bank, or except Capitec, and I don't think Time. I don't know if there's anybody Actually, else. Time, time does. Does Time business. do? Okay, well, there you go. I've learned something new today. But um, you can bank with any bank. Um, just find out if they actually open up business bank accounts. That's the only thing. All right. The next point I've got here is to be aware of loans and credit cards and overdrafts and financing and all those lovely things, especially when you're just starting out. It is it's very hard to actually cut it. You guys who have started out will know that starting a business is most probably one of the hardest things you will ever do. It's really, really throat cut business. All right. But um, to just take out loans and credit cards and overdrafts, it's a um, short-term solution to long-term problem, <laughs> okay? So, or a permanent problem to a temporary solution. That's the better words for it. Um, to get out of it, it's incredibly difficult. And also, by the same token, is the bank will usually have you sign personal surety for that. And what that means is that you will be signing over that, that little... Um, discussion we had about the business and you being two separate entities and um, they call it piercing the corporate veil where they actually make the two one again so this is your business and it's got its assets and it's got its debt but you've now signed personal surety and you've basically given it away so you've now made your own personal stuff the same as the business again so you've told the bank that you know what it's fine i will i will personally vouch for the fact that this company will pay the debt and, um, you know, they don't discuss terms and conditions with, with clients. So a lot of times you end up signing a document without really knowing what you are signing. So just be careful. People burn their fingers every day. All right. We've spoken a bit about an overdraft. It's a battle to get out of. And um, 
On the other hand, oh yeah, it's it's very easy to get a bank account open. We're just talking normal check account or a savings account. Usually you'll open up a checking account for a business. And then in addition, um, I would suggest at least one savings account, sometimes more than one savings account. But um, you basically take your company registration documents, which will be your core 15 document that would give you your name and your address and it's like a little summary of your company. Um, or your ID of your company, if I can put it that way. Um, you take your core 15 and your MOI and along with your ID, if you're the director of the company, because the director has the power to act on the company's behalf. And you take that information to the bank and they'll open up the bank account for you with, what's it, 50 or 100 rand or something like that in there. Last and time was 500 rand. Okay, sorry, my um, Margie just told me it's 500 rand. But um, just double check with the bank how much money they need and... Um, there you go, Bob's your uncle. You've got a business account. Okay. All right. Our big friend, SARS. SARS. So this is going to get some interesting attention. <laughs> so <laughs> I just want to go and just give you guys a bit of background and explain what SARS is all about. Okay. So SARS is responsible for the collection of government revenue. So we all live in the same country and there's a consensus that says that we'll all help to maintain public facilities. So hospitals, roads, municipalities, schools, etc. And that is the reason we pay tax. A business is also seen as a resident of the company and that's why they also have to contribute to SARS in the same way. So most people understand that concept, all right, but they don't realize that there's different types of tax. So a few that I'm going to discuss with you guys today is income tax, and you get income tax for businesses as well as personal. Then you get VAT. You can be a VAT vendor in your personal capacity or in the company, but we're only going to look at companies today. Um, pay as you earn. Pay as you earn is only for companies. Um, it's very seldom, unless you are trading as a sole proprietor, but that's why it gets, we are assuming that you've got a company today and you are registering your company for pay as you earn purposes. Then we have a little man called Koida, all right, that we'll discuss. And also, like I, I just want to reiterate that we are now discussing all of this in line for your business. Just don't forget about your own personal taxes because um, that can be another thing to come and bite you in the butt. Okay. All right. So let's start with income tax. So what's the difference or where does business tax and income, personal income tax fall on the spectrum? All right. So I'm going to start on the left hand side with personal income tax. So most of you, I would assume, have been an employee somewhere in your life. OK, so the majority of you would understand that if you signed a contract to say that you work for 10,000 rand a month, you weren't paid 10,000 rand at the end of the month to your Biggest disappointed in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they take off your IF and at least tax. All right. If you fall over the brackets. So, what makes individual taxes or personal income taxes easy is the fact that if you've signed a contract to work for 10,000 Rand a month, you'll be earning 10,000 Rand for the next 12 months. Okay. So, it's easy to know how much money you're going to be earning in a year and how much tax is going to be due to SARS in a year. All right. So let's say there is 12,000 Rand in total due to SARS for the year. It's 12,000 divided by 12 months is 1,000 Rand a month. So we deduct 1,000 Rand a month every month. At the end of the year, you get your RP5. All your taxes are settled. SARS is happy. You are happy. Happy days. Okay. But now what happens to your business? Because can you imagine how much simpler your life would be if we knew how much money you were going to be making in the next 12 months? <laughs> I know I would be so much more better prepared than we are, than we are at the moment. Um, so where does it leave SARS? I mean, you've got a minister of finance who now have to draw up a budget, who has to, to deal with the company's expenses for, for the next and following 12 months, but you have absolutely no idea how much money you're going to receive. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think businesses bring in about 70% of our revenue. Um, for to to SARS, so um, we as the individuals, we don't pay the majority of that. It's the businesses that bring in the majority of the tax flow, the tax revenue for our country. All right. So where does that leave the Minister of Finance? How how do you deal with this problem? Okay. And 
they have brought in a wonderful little system called provisional tax that deals with that. All right. Um, so how does that work? So provisional tax happens twice a year, six months into your financial year, and then at the end of your financial year. So let's assume that you've got a February year in. It means that your 2022 tax year would have started on the 1st of March, 2021. So six months into it would be the end of August, 2021. And your second period will then be at the end of your financial year, which is the 28th of February, 2022. Okay. Um, so there's two returns that need to go in, one in August and one in February, um, where we do an assessment to see what has happened over the last six months in your business. Um, did you make a profit? And if you've made a profit, how much and what taxes do you need to pay on that? All right. So that is the way that SARS basically know, but listen, I can expect X amount of money coming in and, um, you know, more or less the same should be coming in in another six months time. The other thing that we need to mention is that we need to be within 90% of that calculation when we do versus our final assessment. Because if we don't, then SARS charges us additional penalties and interest because they say, but you haven't paid me my fair share of my money. Okay, so there's not even getting around that little um, <laughs> thing anymore. Um, what we've also noted about your industry specifically is that um, we usually have a very high first period declaration, and then we have a lower or a null declaration towards the end of the year, or, you know, um, in your February submissions, usually because your May, June, July is a very busy period, but you quieten down during November, December, January. So, um, yeah, just so you know as well, that just because I give you a tax bill of 10,000 Rand come July doesn't necessarily mean you'll have a 10,000 Rand again, because it depends on the flow of your industry. Okay, for other, for like a retailer or a grocery shop, pick and pay, those kind of guys, they've got consistent year ends. So, you know, they pay the same more or less throughout the year. You guys tend to pay more on the first period, so end of August. Okay. Um, okay, I just want to, sorry, being interrupted by inboxes here. All right, so what I want need to explain to you as well is that, so provisional tax is, a, is an upfront tax, like pay as you earn as well. So like you would have paid um, your salary, you would have received your salary and you would have had the deduction upfront, and then you have your RB5 and you have your assessment, and then everything squares out. Provisional tax works on the same concept. So you have your provisional tax payments, then you have your year end and your final assessment, and your final assessment gets set off against your provisional tax payments. And then there might be a shortfall or, over, or an overpayment. And if you've paid source too much money, then they will actually refund you. Okay. Okay. So our next friend, it's lovely VAT. All right, so like I've mentioned up front as well, VAT is a separate tax, that, um, a separate tax from your normal income tax. Not everybody is a VAT vendor. Um, you need to be a VAT vendor in order to charge VAT, and that's that 15% that you will see when you go to Pick and Pay or Woolies or wherever, where you'll see they've charged you the 15% over and above their normal fee. Okay, so VAT is government money. It's never your money. You are a collecting agent for the government for this if you are a registered VAT vendor. Okay. Um, your, uh, what I also encounter sometimes is that when you give your invoice and um, the production house tells you, but um, they're not paying the 15% VAT, do you get to choose to go to Woolies and tell them, oh, listen, I'm not, I'm not paying that 15%? You wish. Okay. So it's not negotiable. The moment you are a VAT vendor, that 15% is, is due and payable. Um, you must just also check your contracts. I'm not sure exactly how it's set up, but I think most, the majority of the time, it actually says that if there's an agreed upon fee between the production house for the agent's fee and um, the artist's fee, um, it says that it's exclusive of that. Okay. So up until you're a VAT vendor, it won't affect you. But if you're a VAT vendor, make sure that it says exclusive of that, because otherwise you'll be losing 15% of your revenue and you don't want to do that. Okay. 
Okay, so um, you only need to register as a VAT vendor for SARS when your turnover in any 12 months reaches 1 million rand. Okay, you can as a volunteer, a voluntary, there we go, registration, um, register when your um, sales for the year is 50,000, 50,000, sorry, you have to fact check. <laughs> okay, um, but these guys, I wouldn't advise it. Um, sometimes it happens that a tender requires you to actually have a VAT registration. But the thing is, the amount of admin that goes into being a VAT vendor is I would not advise being registered for VAT unless it's necessary and you've actually gone over that 1 million rand cap. Okay. Also something that I just wanted to clarify, that 1 million rand turnover that I'm talking about now, turnover is your money. It's your sales. Okay, so it's that 10 or 15% commission that you get to charge on the 100,000 rand or 50,000 rand actors fee that they get for doing their job. All right. Um, so it doesn't include your artist salaries. And you will never charge VAT on your artist salaries. It's not your money. Again, you are acting as an agent to collect the fees for the actor, all right, or the artist, and you will be paying it out for them again. It's not your money. All right, it's not part of your sales. Let's say that you've hit the magic number and you are now over a million rand. What happens? Um, you will have to register for VAT purposes with SARS, okay? Um, there's various VAT periods that happen, but you will most probably have to register for a bi-monthly period, which means that it's every two months that you will have to submit a return to SARS and usually make a payment. Your industry lends itself towards a paying VAT vendor set up. <laughs> I don't know what better word to use, sorry. Okay, so what will happen is you'll have a two-month period, and let's say, for instance, that it is your February period, you'll be, have, you have to declare transactions from the 1st of January up until the end of February, and those two months are due before the end of the next month. So your return needs to be at SARS before the end of March, and you also need to make your payment by that time. All right. Um, guys, you'll see today that there's a lot of things that you guys can actually do on your own. Um, you really, um, I would suggest that you go and speak to somebody with the necessary knowledge and to just get a basic understanding and to get your, get the setup correct, because that's very important. But there's a lot of things that you don't have to pay an accountant for right from the get go. Okay. But let me tell you, by the time you hit the VAT mark, you are no longer a small startup business. Okay. You have now entered the, well, I won't say the big leagues, but you have entered a league. Okay. Um, get an accountant on board at that stage to look at it. VAT is a very, very technical um department. There's reconciliations, there's submissions to SARS, there are deadlines, there is it is something to, that needs to be managed. So don't just, when you get to that point, first of all, don't ignore it because SARS will come after you, okay? They are very, very strict about that. I always warn my VAT clients, you know what? You don't mess around with that. Um, SARS locks you up and forgets about you. And then two years down the, the line, they ask you what happened, you know, why, you know, kind of thing. They just don't care. Um, when it comes to VAT, they, they, they are ruthless, promise you, okay? Um. All right, and then the next thing, it's not your money. So if you are a VAT, a VAT vendor, I promise you guys the best, best, best advice that all my clients implement, the guys that listen, okay, <laughs> is um, the moment a deposit hits your bank account, and it doesn't matter which one and which period and whatnot, the moment a deposit hits your bank account, you take 15% of that money and you put it in a separate savings account. That's why I said in the beginning, you have at least a checking account and you have at least one savings account. That'll be your VAT account. Okay. Is um, you put that 15% there and you forget about it. <laughs> All right. And then when so when, when that period comes and your accountant's on your butt and it's like, listen, it's time for VAT, then you've got money in your bank account to at least pay that money because to fall behind, I promise you now you won't get in front. You will not. It is, it's, it's too easy to, to get into that pit. The moment you start using your VAT money as trading money, it's over. It's really, it's over. Okay. Um, I know that this is all very technical. And um, if you're not running away, um, wondering why am I doing this by now? <laughs> yeah, I'll be surprised. 
But um, for those of you who are interested and who are a bit more concerned or would like to know more about VAT, I do have a much more detailed VAT presentation that we can send you that also gives you a lot more nitty gritties. So if you are interested in that, send me an email to info at MGL Accounting and um, we'll send you a copy of that. Okay. Um, uh, where is, hold on a second. Where do I see people? Where's Taryn or Lee? Please I'm just wondering if we shouldn't have a bit of a comfort break. I don't know. Hello? Hi, here we are. We're right there. Yeah. Here. yeah. <laughs> I don't know how you guys feel. I mean, I don't even know if I still have an audience. I'm just blabbing. I'm, <laughs> fa I'm fascinated. Yeah. Okay, I'm well, absolutely fascinated. I think this is amazing. I've just okay. written down a note to get the VAT presentation as well. Yeah, I'm okay. fascinated. Great I don't stuff. Know, Lee, how are you feeling? I'm, yeah. I'm feeling good. I was, I was going to say, if I may, just, you know, rather than a comfort break, perhaps just to, to make mention to everyone that we are going to be doing a lucky draw at the end. Oh, yes, yeah. Uh, Yes, after the Q&A session, we're going to be having a lucky draw. Christelle has been generous enough to offer a free consultation with her. I don't know if you want to expand on that very quickly, Christelle. And my partner, um, she, was, she was the mastermind behind all of this, so you can give okay. her the, the, what is it, the blessing or whatever. <laughs> yes, Lee, basically what we are putting on, on the table is um, for one lucky um, winner, to come in for a consultation with us and to come and chat about your business. And we can, because there, there's a lot of, um, what is the word? It's a general thing. Um, the, the presentation I'm giving today is very, very general, okay? And especially when we get into um, salaries and pay and, and those kind of things now, you will see that um, it's a very blanket application, okay? A lot of times there's something very specific about your business that we can do different or that you can benefit from differently or you know just going back into who you are as a person and um, what are you comfortable with doing in a business that I can tell you but listen don't pay me hundreds of thousands of rands to do x y and z you can do this or if you tell me but listen I'm so scared I don't know how to count on my fingers you know please don't make this my problem um, I can tell you okay but listen you go and focus on marketing you go and focus on systems and setups and whatever the case may be and um, you know leave the technical and the not the technical the accounting and the figures to us you know kind of thing but basically we are we are offering um, for somebody to come in to come and sit with us chat to us about your business if you've got other queries you know um what did I write um your your take on procedures your um your databases your you know there's so much about running a business and that's one thing that um this wonderful lady this is Margie sorry everybody <laughs> This is one thing that Margie is actually um, busy in setting herself up to specialize in his business advisory. So, you know, not just from an accounting perspective, but actually growing your business and finding more opportunities out there and whatnot. So it's a, it's a consultation, but come and brainstorm with us. You know, it's, it, it's not to say it has to be about accounting and taxes. If you look, if you need that, we can offer that, but then um, there's so much more that we can talk about. So um, does you. that yeah. <laughs> okay. so, so we're going to be having that draw then um, at the end. And for now, I'm going to put your email address up in the chats. You did uh, mention that. So I'm going to put it up there. Yes. I'm going to share the link for the survey for people to complete um, after the workshop, if anybody may have missed that, because a couple of people have joined um, after we started. I don't know, Crystal, if you would like us to take one or two questions now. Before you carry on, or if you'd like, yeah, to. I think so. I think let's let's um, let's do a question or two. Let's see okay. where the people are. I've left everybody. <laughs> yeah, we've got people, right? Our guys are here. We've got um, a couple of people. If anybody has a question, please do raise your virtual hand now. Um, and then once we select you, if you could unmute your mic and go ahead and ask Crystal your question. don't see any at the moment it seems everybody is clear at this stage <laughs> oh there we're we are eric it. says it <laughs> has to get all in we're happy to stick it out it's very informative so lovely comment from eric over there thank you so much 
No, hundred percent. Okay, so I think let's let's carry on then. If you if you, if you want. okay, no, hundred percent. As long as everybody's still happy to continue and um, don't feel like chewing their wrists off already. Yeah, <laughs> so. if, you, if you could just share your screen again, Crystal. Yes, Thank yes you. I am busy finding it. There we go. Just let me know when you are seeing it. Yep. Okay. 100%. Okay. So let's continue. Okay. Again, um, uh, I think this is the one tax that um, the majority of you might have encountered already, and that is the good old faithful page you earn. And then along with that little packet comes UIF and SDL. Okay. So I've specified here that as an agent, you will deal with page you earn on two levels. Okay. Um, this is, again, um, pretty um, not specific, but general. No, the other word. <laughs> um, it, it's it's pretty in, um, unique to your industry. Is um, Usually you don't have the, 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 the artist level, if I can put it that way. You're usually only concerned about pay as you earn for your employees. Okay. But unfortunately for you guys, or fortunately, I don't know, but um, you get to deal with your artist page you earn as well. Okay. So um, according to the law, and SARS has been very clear about this on numerous um, communications, interpretation notes, the actual law, the way it's written. Um, yeah, various communications, they've been very, very clear that the agency is not seen as the employer. Okay, and it's the duty of the employer to deduct the pay as you earn and to pay it over to SARS. And that puts it in the hands of the production houses. Okay, which is great, except for our little fly by night um, friends. Okay, so we have a company that comes up and they make use of your actors and your artists and they deduct the 25%, never pay it over to SARS, never gives you an RP5. So your employee is 25% short on money. And there's no way for them to recover it. Okay. So I says that they will, you know, um, what is the word? Neutralize the tax effect on that if you're lucky and after objections and whatnot. But um, you never get that money back that the company deducted if they don't do an RP5 and they don't submit it to SARS. Okay. So I know there's a lot of my um, agent on books that actually you know, pick up the phone after year end and fight with these guys if they can get hold of them, that is, and um, try and convince them and get them to pay that 25% back to the actors so that the actor actually gets its full amount that they originally signed the contract for. So that is a, a big, ugly thing in, in tax law. Okay. Um, there's unfortunately nothing we can do about it. Um, it is what it is. Um, I don't think SARS realizes how much money they actually lose that way. But, um, you know, until somebody wakes up, there's a, you, we can only do what we do with the laws that we are given. Okay. So, um, basically, what I want to tell you guys is that if you have a production company who are now like, there's your full 100%, you know, it's not necessarily the end of the world. The, the biggest thing for you guys is that if you receive 100% of the actor fee, pay the 100% to the actor. And mention to the actor, listen, this is not being taxed. You need to take responsibility for that. Okay. The actor needs to take Yeah, the actor needs to pay to take responsibility. Sorry if that wasn't clear. But, um, you know, you can't, um, I won't say you can't force the production house. Like I say, if the production house themselves, and I mean, some production house accountants are, yeah. wow. Okay. <laughs> We have had our share of interesting people. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, if, if they don't deduct the pay as you earn, rather take the 100%, give it to your actor, and, you know, then the actor is responsible. Because at the end of the day, SARS will go looking for that money at the actor, not at the production house. Okay, very, very seldom that they'll actually go after the production house. And also very seldom that the production house will still be in existence. So, yeah, okay. Um, but... Um, if they deduct the 25%, like I say, just make sure that your actor actually gets the RP5 at the end of the year. So that's important for them. Okay. Um, yeah, um, your responsibility is all the money that you receive 
on behalf of your actor, you have to pay out to them. Guys, do not get stuck on that one, please. It is, this is where you will get into trouble, really. Okay. But that's not where we are right now. We'll get onto that a little bit later as well. Um, we must pay it out if you receive the full amount. Um, okay, and then, uh, the last point on my slide here, very important for you guys to know. Um, by legal definition, your artists are not your employees. Okay, they are, you are just representing them. So you cannot confirm employment for them. All right. I know a lot of times the, the artists um, like to put you down as the employer. Um, you can confirm on what production they're working and what the contract links are, you know, all kinds of funny things like that. But they do not work for you. They do not earn a salary from you. OK. And that's also why there's no UIF and SDL implications from your company for them. OK. Um, <clears throat> all right, then. That was the first level is for your artists. The second level, and um, if you guys are just starting out, then this will most probably be a, a, an avenue that you will venture down only later in life, okay? <laughs> because it's a, it's a treacherous one. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but this is if you start hitting that place where you need to employ somebody to help you um, get through all the work. All right. It's a different and it's an extensive department all on its own. Um, I am definitely not covering everything that you need to know. Um, th this, a lot of this will happen through experience, unfortunately. All right. There's no handbook for this. It's almost as bad as raising kids. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but um, you can go to the Labor Department's website, labor.gov.za. And um, just see and read up on um, a couple of labor laws and just know what you can and can't do. How many hours is an employee supposed to work? When is a break mandatory? How much leave do they need to have? When does maternity leave come in? There's a reason lawyers specify, uh, specif specialize, sorry, see what I mean with words. <laughs> so, but there's a reason lawyers specify in this um, specific um, specific. Um, what is that wrong? <laughs> direction there we go <laughs> so um it's because it's really complex okay but um at the same time i want to tell you that for you guys it doesn't have to be that complex okay you don't have to go and get a an hr and an ir manager and an industrial psychologist and goodness only knows whatever it can be simplified all right but just know that there is there could be scenarios and it always happens to the best of people where you get, um, what is that word? Not abused, but taken advantage taken of. advantage of. You see, I need my interpreter next to me. <laughs> okay, yeah, there we go. All right, but just some basics. So that um, if you get to that point where you need to um, to get somebody along to help you and that the CCMA doesn't end up cleaning the floor with you, employment contracts. Guys, imperative. You can't have an employee without an employment contract. Non-negotiable. Okay. Um, you need to specify at least duties, working hours, what pay they're going to receive, what leave they're entitled to. Um, another thing that is very important is if you've read that an employee needs a meal break after five hours, your contract can't say that an employee is only entitled to a leave break, uh, to a lunch break after seven hours. You can't contravene the labor laws in your contract. Okay, the labor law will always um, override, yeah, override the, your contract. All right. But that's why make sure that you put stuff in there that is on par with the law. Okay. Um, if minimum wage is 4,000 Rand, you can't pay them 2,000 Rand for a full week. Okay. It's, it's stuff like that where you will, you will get taken out. All right. Another important thing that you need to know is that you must keep a copy of your employee's ID. It's mandatory for you to have that on file. And if they're a foreigner, you need a copy of their passport and their work permit. Did you know that it's illegal to employ a foreigner without a work permit? You can get locked up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, it's silly things like this that we, you know, as a business owner, you don't always think about these things. And um that's why I say, you know, even with um, offering you some consulting services and some uh, um, 
as part of the prize kind of thing. Um, hardly anybody that I know of starts a business knowing how to run a business. You know how to do the job of your business. You know how to be a good agent, you know, to actually go and to know all of this is a different ball game. So prepare yourself. <laughs> You're in for a big learning curve. Okay. All right. Leave days. Um, a minimum of 15 working days per year you need to allow your employee. Okay. Pay slips. You, your employees are entitled to a pay slip and they mustn't ask you for one. They must get one as part of their um, duties and whatnot. And it has to say on there, my employee earns 10,000 Rand, less my 800 Rand to SARS, less my 200 Rand to the UIF or whatever it is. Okay. It has to say how much leave there is. So, um, you know, it's not your responsibility. I've had clients before who tell me that, um, no, but I don't want to give them their pay slips because um, then I, you know, if they ask me for my pay slip, I know when they're going to go and make debt. It's not your responsibility, <laughs> guys. It's, it's, you can't be responsible. You can't play mommy to, to your employees. Okay. So, but yeah, be aware of, um, of the contracts and the legal implications and stuff like that. Okay. All right. I was asked to, to talk a bit about structuring of salaries and um, what is available and stuff like that. And unfortunately, with people just taking so much advantage of um, things, SARS has basically closed down everything. But, you know, with the slightest loophole, SARS has closed down already. So, um, unfortunately, at the moment, you basically sit with a basic salary to be taxed and then there's a couple of allowances that are still available but you really need to be sure of your of of the fact that you are um if you are um, able and you, if you qualify sorry for um for this allowance um if you don't qualify for instance for a travel allowance you will end up paying more tax okay if you don't um structure a motor vehicle allowance correctly um you're going to your employees are going to suffer, okay, or you might suffer, all right, so my best advice is to speak to your accountant, speak to somebody who knows, and present your specific scenario to them, so that they can actually look at it, and, um, you know, give you the best advice based on your specific scenario, okay, but um, another thing that I also want to tell you is that um, so, oh, tax has a way of working itself, out, but you know, through the system anyway. So if you could have gotten a medical aid um, or an RA uh, benefit in your pay slip, um, but you claim it at your end, it would it would work itself out through the wash. So you either get the benefit every month when you're running the payroll, or you get it at your end when you submit your taxes and you get a refund. So um, it's really a timing thing. The finance gurus will tell you, but um, there's time value of money and you should have had your money every month and your assessment should be zero. And true, there is some truth to it. For a country who doesn't like to save, I can promise you people jump through hoops to get refunds from SARS every year. So, yeah. But just to put some of the allowances, um, you know, just to bring some of them to your attention. Um if you use a cell phone, airtime, line rentals, and data, if the majority of that cell phone and data, et cetera, is being used for business purposes, and SARS has got a pretty word, they say the private use is incidental, okay, then you can have a cell phone with some data and whatever on it without paying um, fringe benefit tax on it. Right, you can have a travel allowance. Say, for instance, that you have somebody who takes their own car and drives around to different production houses, drop, um, drop off contracts and, I don't know, collect your post, you know, funny stuff. If there's somebody who does a lot of driving for business, not from home to work and from work to back, that's excluded. They can qualify for a travel allowance. Um, you have to keep a logbook, all right? So the moment you don't keep a logbook, on assessment, SARS throws that out and they make you pay the full tax on that. Okay. Um, the, the next bunch of stuff, stuff like a housing allowance, use of a motor car vehicle, subsistence allowances, retirement annuities, medical aids, 
guys, now we're still getting to, to speak to, um, this is big companies. This is not um, cheap benefits, if I can put it this way. A housing allowance would be if you pay an employee's rent or you actually rent a house for an employee to live in. So, um, you know, there's a French benefit tax on it. So it might, there's a, there's a big forward and backwards about do I pay 7,000 rand rent a month or do I pay the tax on 7,000 rand rent a month <laughs> kind of thing. So it, it comes out to the same thing, basically. Um, the use of a motor vehicle. Um, if your company owns a car and the employee gets to use the car, um, instead of paying for the car, they pay the tax on the car, all right? But um, there's some backwards and forwards and, and, and nice things that you can do in your own company because in your company, you can now claim some of the expenses. So where do you want to shift the tax burden? So, yeah, like I say, it's, it's detailed conversations, okay? And sometimes it takes calculations to actually see if it's worth it or not, okay? Um, what works for one guy might not work for another. Um, subsistence allowances, that's when an employee has to spend a night away from home for business. So say, for instance, one of your employees have to fly down to Cape Town to go and, I have absolutely no idea, recruit three artists in Cape Town or something. <laughs> you know, um, you can, there's a fee that they will qualify for that they can get tax-free for um, expenses, et cetera, that they have to pay for. Um, retirement annuities, um, guys, anybody making a private contribution to a retirement annuity funds can claim it back from SARS. You can run it through a payroll for, the, for your company if you want to. It becomes a bit technical because um, you don't know when that person stops paying that RA. So now suddenly everybody sits with a tax liability at the end of the year and everybody's blaming everybody. So, yeah, um, I would stay away from that. Medical aid contributions, same thing. Um, you're going to get your, your benefit whether you submit your claim at the end of the year to SARS or whether you do it through a payroll. And you won't know when that employee stops paying the medical aid and they won't tell you. And, yeah, that's it's hard. <laughs> okay, But um, like I say, it, it is doable. There's a lot of things that are doable. But um, rather speak to somebody with whatever specific you have in mind. If you have a medium-sized business who's on its feet and you feel like, you know what, my employees are suffering. They, um, I would like to have a medical aid that the company pays for, blah, blah, blah. Chat to your accountant. See what the options are. See what the, what the tax implications is for the company, for the employee, um, you know, because it goes both ways. It's, it's not just one or the other. All right. So, like I said, unfortunately, it's <laughs> can't really give you a straight answer here. <laughs> Okay. All right. So um, the next topic to, to deal with is UIF. Okay. So this will only be for employees working for your company. So none of your artists. Okay. As a company, you have to register as an employer with the labor department and you get a U number. Um, you'll see there's a little U dash and X's, okay, because your number would be unique to your company, all right? That U number is not the same as your page your number, okay? So your page your number with SAR starts with a seven, okay? When you employed, when you now employ your first employee, they will also be registered against your U number as an employee, okay? So you've got an employer with a number, and then you'll have different employees against this number. Okay. If you pay pay as you earn to SARS, if you've got enough salaries and there's tax that you need to pay over to SARS, then you can pay your UIF to SARS directly and they will pay it over to the Labor Department. Okay. But if you if you don't pay pay as you earn or you're not registered for pay as you earn purposes, then you have to pay that UIF amount to the UIF department monthly. And um, I think that's also by the 7th. Yeah. 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 Pay as you earn is always due by the 7th of the month um, following your, your payroll. So we're in, our, in October. So my October salaries gets paid out somewhere between the 25th and the 30th of October. My October pay as you earn needs to be with SARS or the UIF department by the 7th of November. Okay. So it's always the month following where you're, where you've determined your, your salaries. Um, there's a declaration form called a UI-19 that needs to go to the UIF department as well every month. 
And this is where the whole TERS wagon fell over for most people. Because most people paid their UIF and their pays you earn, but nobody ever submitted the UR19s. And what the UR19s does is a UR19 tells the, UR, the Labor Department now, so I've received 2,000 rand. Why did I receive 2,000 rand? So it's for employee A is 300 rand. Employee three B is 700 rand. How does that 2,000 rand being made up? And also because it now determines or it influences how your benefits are determined when you want to put in a claim against your UIF. Okay, so your, your, your UI19 is a very important document that needs to go in every month. Okay. It is not optional. Okay, it's like that 15% VAT line with checkers and woolies and whoever. Okay, it's not optional, guys. Um, if I work for an employee, employer, the employer deducts 1% from my salary and the company, the employer, contributes another 1%. Okay. It is capped at the moment at 17,712, so 17,712 rand a month. Okay. So if your employee earns 20,000 rand, the UIF contribution is only worked out on that 17,000 rand. Okay, so 177.12 from my salary and from the company. All right. If the, if the employee only earns 7,000 rand, it's 70 rand from them and 70 rand from the company. Okay. So why do we have UIF? Um, basically, it is to make provision for if you were to lose your job. So it, again, um, if it if it only meant that you would get your salary while you were unemployed, that would be great. But um, unfortunately, it's not. But it's at least a little bit. <laughs> okay. So um, you can claim when you have to go on maternity leave, if you're incapacitated, if you have reduced hours, if there's retrenchment, or if you go on retirement. Um, if you die while you're employed, your, in, your dependents can actually put in a claim to the UIF department and receive a portion of your salary back for a couple of months after your death. Um, but you, UIF will not pay when you resign. Resigning or when your employees resign. Resigning means that you are making an active decision to not work. Okay. Whether it is to, to move to another company or to just sit at home or whatever the reason is, if you resign, you make an active decision not to work and they, they won't um, support that fact. So if there's a specific, there's another reason why you can't work. So there's a medical reason you've just had a baby or you are retirement age or your contracts come to, I think contract comes to an end. Yeah, contract comes to an end, stuff like that. You can apply for it. Okay. But again, you can't apply for UIF benefits if you haven't contributed. Okay. Skills development levy. Um, again, I don't know how many of you will really fall into that category, into this category already. Um, usually the small, just starting out guys, not really. It's only applicable if your payroll for the year exceeds half a million rand. Okay. And again, SARS has got this beautiful thing about any 12 months. So it's not necessarily your tax year or your financial year. Um, SARS can just pick any 12, 12 consecutive months. Okay. And if it's over that, then they clap you with an assessment. Okay. Um, this is a company contribution. It's not something that your employees contribute to. It's, it's an expense for the company. Um, it has to be paid to SARS every month, and it's 1% of your taxable payroll. So there's a difference between your gross payroll and your taxable, well, sometimes there's a difference between your gross payroll and your taxable payroll. Um, some benefits and some benefits um, might not be taxable, but that's few and far between. But um, that'll be an accounting function to determine the difference. Um, so what is skills development levy? should have maybe started with that part. <laughs> But um, it, your, your skills development levy goes to the CETAs, all right? And CETAs are different funds that are set up in all the various industries um, of government so that we can further develop the skills of our employees, okay? So your industry 
is the Cath Sita. Um, it's hospitality and art and culture, tourism. Yeah, I think that's all of them. Um, like, for instance, the accountants got facet, um, financial industry. Um, you've got the mining industry. You get all. Give me a switch, then. Oh, okay. <laughs> CETA stands for the Sector Education and Training Authority. Well, there we go. So, thank you. <laughs> so, point is that um, any training that you do, well, the, the how can I say, the, the proposed benefit behind a CETA is that any kind of training that you do in-house for your employees, you are supposed to be able to claim back from a CETA, okay? It's not easy. <laughs> I'll give you that much, okay? Sometimes it's easier to register with your CETA and to just go to all the free programs that they actually offer, all right? Um, but we don't, we, for instance, don't do any claiming from CETAs because it's just such a complex scenario, um, you've got to prove everything that you've done and you've got to submit a heck of a lot of documents, blah, blah. So it's not something that we specialize in, but if it's something that you would like to consider, um, Google's your friend. Um, there's a lot of companies out there that specialize in claiming from CETAs, but it's, it's training basically. You provide training and um, you get to claim a financial reimbursement for training that you've provided. Okay. But again, like I say, You've got to pay to the CETA in order to be able to claim from the CETA. Payroll needs to be over 500,000. Yeah. Okay. All right. Then our friend Koida. Um, a lot of people don't know about this one. Um, used to be called workman's compensation. All right. Um, all companies have to register with Koida. All right. Or the moment you, that you have an employee, you have to register with COIDA. Um, the easiest way to look at this is to um, to look at it as like a kind of insurance, okay, for the for an employee that gets hurt while he's doing his job. All right. Um, if you are registered, the injured employee um, basically claims from the COIDA fund instead of suing or making a claim against your company that can potentially put your company in, in, into financial ruin. Start um, So this would be, this can be anything. If a brick falls on a guy's head at, at you know, at work or somebody slips on a wet floor, um, if there's a car accident, um, we've had scenarios where people are actually, they're in, you know, they're a driver for a company and, um, they get into an accident and actually die. You know, it's, it's, these things happen, unfortunately. But um, the, the whole point of this is to protect your company and to, um, to have a claim against the COIDA fund instead of against the company. All right. So what happens is you register your company again as an employer with the COIDA. And um, then once a year, there's an assessment that runs, it, it, it's based on your payroll. It's based on the payroll from the previous financial year, as well as an estimated payroll for the next financial year. And then also the risk factor, the risk ratio of your industry comes into play. So you can imagine working on a building site has got a lot more potential for injuries than sitting behind a computer working in an accounting firm. And um, so, yeah, the, the risk for, for your agency um, level work is not, is not substantial. Um, it will depend on your on your salaries for the year, but um, anything between, I think the highest I've seen in your industry, and that's a pretty lucrative firm, is four, four and a half thousand rand a year. So, yeah, it's, it's not that bad. <laughs> so, considering what you could be in for for going to doctors and having um, car accidents and all kinds of stuff happening. Okay. All right, so that basically gives you an overview of the different taxes that you are in for from a company point of view. We had company tax, which is dealt with via the provisional tax system, pay as you earn, VAT, and COIDA, 
and then you have an SDL that falls within the page you and set up. Okay. The last one that I just want to reiterate and bring to your attention is remember we've now dealt with the business. We still need to deal with you. <laughs> okay. Your personal income taxes. So let's be honest. Why are you even considering opening up your own firm or even, you know, why did you consider in the beginning to, to start on your own, your own con consulting agency, your own <laughs> artist agency? Um, and it's usually about a paycheck. Um, it's usually about making your own decisions, having freedom to do things. And but the, the biggest driver behind it is that you get to write your own salary or your own paycheck. OK. But that, too, has got implications. Just remember that any time you are making money, any time in a business, in your personal name, selling anything worth worth money. OK, I'm not talking about um I'm talking about Persian carpets and investment art and second properties, stuff like that. Any, any time that you are making money, you will be taxed. The system is set up that way. You can make your peace with it. If you're not paying tax, you're not making money. It's as easy as that. Okay. Um, so um, we're in it for to write our own paychecks. And but the thing is, now I get a paycheck, and um, this is also where where a lot of people get sting, sting, stung, stung. Sorry, English. <laughs> okay, um, because you see that there's ten thousand rand in the bank account, and you need a salary end of the month, so you take the ten thousand rand. Okay, where's the tax? I don't know. I'll deal with it later. Sure, you will. <laughs> Okay. There's no boss that deducted from your pay from your salary. There's no pay as you earn system in place. Yeah. Okay. It's easy to get yourself into a problem. Okay. So the, the best way, guys, right from the beginning to deal with this is to declare a salary to yourself. Okay. Um, whether it's three thousand Rand or whether it's thirty thousand Rand or whether it's three hundred thousand Rand. Okay. Get into the habit of declaring a salary to yourself. Okay. This is the best way to stay on top of it. And I know it's not easy. I know as a small business, you know, you're just trying to make end of the month. <laughs> you're just trying to eat. Okay. <laughs> we know. We've been there. <laughs> okay. And um, what what I would suggest, okay, um, especially if you've been doing this for like six months a year, those kind of things. Chat to you to an accountant or somebody who knows who can help you, or if you know how to do this yourself, it's also fine. Um, but realize how much you need to survive. Okay. I like a salary of 30,000 Rand because it covers all my, you know, my extras, but I need a salary of 10,000 Rand to pay the bond, the car, the whatever. And I'm just throwing figures out there. Okay. If you know that you need a salary of 10,000 Rand to survive. Okay. You need to basically bring in enough work so that you can get your 10,000 Rand at the end of the month. Okay. That's the, the hard reality of it. Okay. But if you know that you need 10,000 Rand, sit down with an accountant, do the calculation so that you know that you need to actually be earning 12,000 Rand a month in order to take home 10,000 Rand a month. Okay. If you registered for pay as you earn, it makes it easy. You declare your 2,000 Rand every month. You get your RP5. Bob's your uncle. Everybody's happy end of the year. Same way that you would have been as an employee. If you're not registered for pay as you earn and you're disciplined enough, you can do it through the provisional tax system, which would mean that you earn, make enough money for your 12,000 Rand a month, save your 2,000 Rand a month in a separate bank account, Preferably with another bank, that you don't touch it, kind of thing. And um, then you take your 10,000 Rand to live off. You see why it's so, why it's better to pay it to SARS immediately? Because next month there's a problem and it's easy to take that money and live off that. Okay. So, yeah. That would be my best suggestions, if I can put it that way. Then the last um, option that we can just mention to you. It's not really a viable option right now for the space that you guys operate in, especially being start out um, entities. Okay. And that's dividends. All right. As, um, as a shareholder of a business, you're entitled to dividends. Okay. 
<clears throat> but it's pretty expensive from a tax point of view. Okay. Um, because we are all start out small businesses, those kind of things, I'm assuming that you are the owner of this business. Okay. You cannot get a dividend if you're not the owner, if you're not the shareholder. If you're just the director and your husband or your fiance or a friend or your brother or whoever is actually the shareholder of the business, you are not entitled to dividends. Okay. Then you're just the director. Then you're entitled to a salary. Okay. But how dividends work is dividends is basically if you have traded for a period and I've made some money. So let's say there's a hundred thousand rand in profits that I've made. Okay. Now I go into the next financial year. I get to distribute some of that hundred thousand rand to the owner for his investment, his risk, all of that kind of stuff into this business. Okay. But now the problem with that is the, is the tax. Because I need to pay 28% company tax on the 100,000 Rand. Plus, when I declare a dividend, there's dividend tax, which is another, it's not, it's not a straight 46%, but it's got, a, it's got a formula behind it. But it basically assumes that the shareholder would have received tax at the max marginal rate, which is 46%. So it's a heck of a lot of tax just to get some money out. Um, to give you an, a, an, a better idea, let's assume you're the shareholder and the director of the company. You've got 100,000 rand sitting there that you want to take out. Um, your salary is 20,000 rand a month. That gives you 240,000 rand for the year. You are way under, what is it, 1.5 million max marginal rate. Hmm, I think so. 1.5 is where we're sitting at for max marginal rate of 46%. Okay. So you've got a bit of salary to make up between 240,000 to 1.5. You can take your 100,000 Rand and pay most probably about 36% tax instead of 46% plus a 28%. Okay. But the thing is, this is again discussions that you have with your accountant when you are there and you want to take a bonus and you've made some money and you've worked your butt off and it's time for some payback. Okay. So, yeah. All right, I think that basically covers the tax scenario. Well, when I say covers, it is a broad overview of tax. So <laughs> tax will consume you, I promise you. It's, it's for a business, it's, it's death and taxes. It's really, yeah. And um, other points of interest that um, we need to just mention to you guys is BBEE, -E -E. <laughs> B -E -E. what is it? What is it for? What does it stand for? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So it stands for broad based black economic empowerment. All right. And it's something that the government brought in with the whole um, intention. intention. I want to say idea, but my linguist links to me intention is to basically empower our black shareholders. All right. Coming from the apartheid regime and whatever, how do we bring um, the black empowerment into economy? And basically, the way it works is um, every company will have a BEE score, okay? Um, you will see just now that because you're a very small business, you basically, what they are saying is we are so small that um, we fall into a little exempted block, okay? But if we're talking about a little bit bigger company, you have a BEE scorecard, and it's made up with all of your customers and your suppliers. Um, I think it's just customer suppliers. Yeah, suppliers. And employees. I wanted mm. to say there's another one. Yeah. So customer suppliers and employees. And um, there's a whole formula on which they work out. And then they say, I make use of Walton's for my stationery. What is Walton's scorecard? How, you know, how does Walton's rate? And then I've got a... Contract with Bitvest. How does Bitvest rate? You know, and all of those information, that information gets pulled together to make my own scorecard. And that will give me a certain rating. But it basically tells me how many black people are involved in bringing this whole chain together. Okay. And the higher that number is, the happier they are because it's creating more jobs. It's bringing the less fortunate, what, what is it? previously disadvantaged. disadvantaged there we go yeah my words um it's bringing that ratio back up and that's what they want okay 
And that's the reason why they ask for these things. So it's usually when you work with government tenders and um, big projects that, that you will get asked one of these things. Um, but I almost want to say hardly ever will use a very small business get asked for one. But if you do get asked for one, okay, what is the most cost effective way to do it? Because you can pay literally hundreds of thousands of rands for a BEE scorecard. It is, it can get pretty intense. Okay. Um, for the smaller guys, for us normal Joes on the ground, okay, this can be done by your accountant. CRPC, the company registrar, has got a declaration for an exempted micro enterprise. Okay. So as long as your turnover is below 10 million in a year, in a financial year, you're regarded as an exempted micro enterprise. 10 million, hey? Drops in the ocean, us little guys. So yeah. <laughs> when your turnover goes above 10 million Rand, then when, that's when you have to go to a rating, a rating agency who will have to do a formal um, certificate for you and like I say those are complex it's a complex process they go through every single supplier every single customer every employee what's their ethnicity where do they come from oh, blah 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 like I say it's a massive thing and it will cost you a heck of a lot of money so um, there's no need for that on your scale please up until 10 million it's a two or a three pager document commissioner of oath stamp on it just to say who's your share or you know the ethnicity of your shareholders um, yeah, and some company details. It's straightforward, not a problem. Okay. Then accounting, accounting accounts package options. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, guys, there are many available. Um, to do your 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 books, um, it's important. It's very important. You won't know if you're making money or not making money if you don't do your books. You've got to know your numbers. Okay, it's very important. Um, packages available. There's many um, packages available. Um, but the big thing is, do you know how to use it? <laughs> all right. And QuickBooks and Sage and Zero and all of these guys have made it their marketing mission to tell anybody they can be an accountant. And it's true. Um, it, coming from where we started to where we are now, it is a heck of a lot easier to work on a program. But also, in the same time, I can tell you that just seeing what clients do every month to their books, if you're not an accountant, you do not know what you're doing. <laughs> okay. Or the, the odds are you don't know what you're doing. Okay. Um, do you understand debits and credits? Do you understand when it must go up? Do you understand what is the, le well, not the legal, the IFRS definition for an asset, for a liability, for an expense, for an income? What is the tax implications on those, those transactions? Um, it's a technical thing. There's a reason we study and do all the things we do for the many years that we do them. Okay. All right. So the package that we like best is QuickBooks online. Um, but you can also use Sage or Xero or, like I say, even Excel. If you're just sorting out, Excel is sufficient, guys. You can do Excel and a pivot table. That will be sufficient. But you need to be disciplined and actually do it and do it properly. <laughs> okay. So. Um, even if you're planning on doing Excel and doing it by yourself, go and sit with somebody and speak to them, see how it works, have them go through uh, an example with you, make sure you know how it works, because you know what, otherwise you get zero at, what is it, how many dollars a month, ridiculously expensive, okay, at how many dollars a month, all right, that you pay, you import your bank statement, you allocate your expenses only to get to a trial balance that your accountant goes, it's wrong. I'm going to charge you to redo all of this. Why? You know, it's, it's, it's like I say, just, just go up front and get it right up front. Okay. Don't, don't shoot yourself in the foot. It's not necessary. Okay. There's also a lot of free software packages out there. Um, Google's your friend. <laughs> okay, I can't remember. I haven't used them in a while, but a um, lot of overseas-based platforms, but um, there are a couple that you can use for South African as well. Um, anything goes, but like I say, if, if you know Excel, it's all you need. Okay. Again, this is uh, pretty important to me. It depends on the type of person you are. Okay, I've had agents who could have just as well been an accountant in another life. Okay, they flew through all of this. They do their own invoicing. They can reconcile a bank statement. They 
know how to do things. They understand what I'm talking about. It is just, yay, all the, all the way, you know. And at the same time, I can sit with a brilliant agent who they just don't get it. Same thing with artists and actors is they are brilliant, brilliant, brilliant in what they do. But when it comes to the figures, it just doesn't talk to them. They don't have the discipline. They don't have the interest. They don't have the, it, it's just not something they want to deal with. And let's be very honest. There's a lot of stuff that you can do for very cheap while you're starting out. Okay. If you are one of those people who are disciplined, who understand Excel, who's got a bit of math skill, who can see how to balance a thing and whatnot, by all means, do your own box. Not a problem. Okay. You will get to a point where you can't do it anymore. It's called growth. <laughs> okay. All of us get there. But if you know, if you know that you know that you know that you can't do one plus one, okay, and that you will not keep your paperwork together and that you will lose the slip and that you won't download the bank statement and blah and blah and blah, just pay somebody to do it. Save yourself a heck of a lot of trouble. Go and see somebody and pay somebody money to do it because it will save you if you're lucky, some jail time, <laughs> okay, um, a heck of a lot of tax, most probably, this is really one of the areas where rather spend some money if you're not sure, if you don't know what to do, and you can't get it right on your own, rather spend some money, you can rather spend your time more productively doing what you do, getting more commission in, getting more work for your agents, doing the marketing whatever, okay, getting your websites, getting your systems, getting a lot of stuff going for your business that will make your business more fruitful, yeah, <laughs> more message. Better use of time. Yeah, it's a better use of your time to go and spend it doing what you do best than to try and sit there for three hours and go, what the heck? I don't know. How do I do an invoice? Okay. So something to consider, something to think about. Yeah, just know. Okay. All right. Managing cash flow and expenses. Oh, always tough. Always tough. Especially for startups. Okay. Um, in order for your business to grow and for you to have a salary, you have to make money. Okay. So your commission portion, that percentage that you charge, less any expenses that you will pay to run your and operate your business. Telephone account, the internet, um, salaries, computer, all of that. So if I've got 10,000 Rand and it cost me 8,000 Rand and there's 2,000 Rand left over, then I've got a profit. Okay. Now, another thing to keep in mind, does that 8,000 Rand include some money for you or is the 2,000 Rand left over for you? So you've got to be very specific about what's included in that 8,000 Rand. On that 2,000 rand, the net profit that stays over, that's what you will pay tax on. And although you want to keep that figure as low as possible because you don't want to pay too much tax, okay, at the same time, as I said earlier, you will only pay tax when you're making money. There's no point in having commission of 10,000 rand, expenses of 11,000 rand, and being in the negative of 1,000 rand. Where's the negative going to come from? It needs to come from somewhere. Overdraft, loans, you're not taking a salary, getting your car repossessed, whatever. You know, it, it needs to come from somewhere. I would I always say to clients, if I take if I give you a thousand rand and I say to you, give me two hundred and eighty rand back, but you keep you get to, to keep the rest, okay? Would you rather say to me, No, I don't want the thousand rand at all, or would you just give me the two hundred and eighty rand? That's the concept of tax guys. Okay. Um, I, for one, would like to keep the, what is it, 720 rand <laughs> that you get to keep if you if you have a 1,000 rand less the 280 rand, which is the tax portion. You still get to keep some money. Yes, tax suck, okay? But you still need to get, you, you still get to keep some money, okay? It's not like having a minus 1,000 because a minus 1,000, you need to go and finance somewhere. And that's harder, okay? All right. Um, about managing your cash flow and your expenses. An excellent book. If you've got the time, no, not if you've got the time, make the time. You can get this on um, 
Ja, Amazon and what's the audio one? Audiobooks. Audiobooks, yeah. Yeah, but these are audible. audible. There we go. But I mean, I think it's also available on Google Books and just go and Google it. This Profit First by Mike Michalowicz. Guys, it's a game changer. It will open your eyes to the way how to manage money in a business. Um, it's all about, um, yes, we make money. We've got sales. We've got commission. And then it's about keeping that expenses um, figure as low as possible and really trying to drive that expense figure low, 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 low. But also to help us with the concept of now we've made 10,000 rand sales. We've got 6,000 rand in expenses instead of eight. So we've got 4,000 rand left over. What do we do with that 4,000 rand? Do we just go out and have a party? No, we need to remember that tax is coming up in August. Okay. I would like a bonus in December. Um, I need to buy a new computer next year. Okay. So we've got different. Now I want to say jars. Um, but but you've got you've got different holders, you've got different placeholders where you need to go and stash some money. And that's why you might end up with seven and twelve savings accounts for the different things. And the bank it charges, you know, yeah. The point is it's it's the um the thought process and the mechanics behind this that makes it work. That is just Incredible because suddenly you know that that thousand rand over there is not party money, it's new computer money. Well, this 500 rand over here, it's not um, buy new stationery or I don't know, whatever, you know, increase in salary money. That is actually tax money because by the time the tax man comes knocking, oh crap, where's my, where's my money? Am, am I going to make enough money? You know, kind of thing. So it, it really puts it into perspective. So it's it's an excellent book to read. I, I highly recommend it. And it works in any industry, any industry. It's 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 amazing. Okay. All right. Um, last point there. Remember, if you're paying tax, you're making money. Okay. You want to pay tax. Okay. Well, you don't want to pay too much tax, but you want to pay tax. Okay. Um, then, oh, just to, get, just to come back to taxes as well. Just remember, a good accountant will sit with you and they will help you manage that tax burden. We will, you know, I mean, we, I sit with my clients every year and we go through where's the best, the best tax opportunity for you? Where can we structure it? Where can we move money to? Where do we declare the, the money differently? It's called, there's a big difference between tax structuring and tax avoidance. Okay. Tax avoidance is illegal, all right? It's where you decide you're not paying tax regardless. Right. Or evasion. Evasion, evasion avoidance, same thing then. Yes. Anyways, <laughs> tax evasion. Okay, we don't do that, all right? There's legal ways to reduce your tax liability. That's called tax structuring, all for it. I will never make you pay a cent more than you need to pay. Never. It's no, why? Okay, but um, yeah. All right. Anyway, done with that part. All right. The last, I think it's the last. Okay. Anyway, the next part, insurance. Okay. What kind of insurance do you actually need? All right. Um, general insurance um, for your computer, your cell phone, your servers. If you've got a server, if you've got a switchboard, stuff like that. That is essential, guys. Look, I'm not too concerned about a cell phone because the cell phone you can, you can, maybe easily replaced. I don't know. You've got to determine your risk factor. But um, a computer, if I lose my computer, I'm screwed. Okay. So it's a non-negotiable for me. My computer has to be insured. Okay. Um, then the next thing that we don't always think about is your intellectual property. Um, you have to have copies and backups of your contracts and your work and your bank statements, your financials, your all of those stuff, your website contents, your active information um guys what happens if you are hacked what happens if your computer gets stolen um you know and there are cheap alternatives you don't have to go and pay hundreds of thousands of grand you can have dropbox up to a certain level and even after that we're talking about 200 rand a month you know um google drive you know what we <laughs> we have a dropbox and a google drive and an itunes and <laughs> it's 
there's free limits everywhere, you know, and you can have three different email addresses. <laughs> can have free, you know, there's ways and there's means, but the point is have the damn backups, you know. I promise you, until you've been through a through a scenario where you've lost work, you won't realize how much work you've got to lose. Okay. Um, inboxes, emails, back it up, guys. Speak to an IT person. It's it's yeah. If you don't know an IT person, tell, ask me. I'll, I'll refer somebody to you. Okay. Um, and then the last one that I've got on, on here is called indemnity insurance. Okay. <clears throat> so what is it and why do you need it? And again, here, I would say, consider your risk and consider the costs. Okay. In my industry, it is, it's a big one. Okay. Same with doctors, same with lawyers. Okay. Um, if we give any kind of advice or um, if I, for instance, make a boo-boo on your tax calculation or something and there's a big loss, um, I can get sued. Okay. So if, if I can be proven negligent, there is um, a, a law. Oh, my word, I'm running out of words now. <clears throat> you can make a legal case for me against me, and you can actually sue me for negligence. Okay, same with doctors, same with lawyers. Okay, I'm not so sure exactly where does it end on your spectrum, but I will, or I will, I would think that it's most probably land somewhere with your artists. Okay. Um, you're going to, you're going to have to consider what is the risk? What is the risk of them actually suing you? What could bring about, uh, uh, an activity or a scenario where they can sue you? And, um, then also, if you want to get coverage against that, um, you're going to have to speak to some insurance companies to find out, um, would they cover you and what would the cost be and what would the amount be and up to, because I mean, we will be, we get insured for just the, the damages that there is. Um, to the client and um, your yeah, ours are not that well depending on a lot of red tape and stuff but ours are not that expensive um, a, a very specialized doctor surgeons for instance pay through their behinds for these specific kind of insurances so yeah it's not really something I've come across often in your industry but Okay. All right. Then accounting service requirements. Guys, this is my basically my takeaways from today. Speak to somebody to get you started and get you on the right track and you, who you can ask when you're not sure. I think that to me is also the big one. Um, clients just don't ask you. They come in for a meeting and um, they you tell them to please Chat with me before you make any decisions so you know the implications and you never hear from them. And three years down the line, they're like, oh, I did the X and Y and Z. And you're like, oh, my word, why would you do that? You know, you have just screwed yourself so badly. Um, pick up the phone and ask. Send a, a WhatsApp. Send an email. You know, it's so easy. All right. There's a lot you can do yourself, um, especially when you're starting out and you're not that busy. But again, don't get yourself into trouble by thinking you can do it all and you don't really know what you're doing. Okay. If you're going to do things on your own, meet with your accountant at least once a year, twice if you can. All right. Let them just put an eye over the books and just see if everything's happy and you're, you're doing the right thing and that everything's still hunky-dory. Okay. Stay on top of your debtors. Don't let people who owe you money get away with it. Okay. Over and above for the fact that it's your actor's money as well. Hello. You need to love, you know. Don't get behind on your paperwork. Don't um, don't think that you'll do this next week or next month or whatever. If you're a month behind, you're behind, okay? You're not current. You need to know your figures real time, okay? Um, file and pay your taxes. It's it's important. It, it, will, it will be the end of you if you don't do your tax, I promise you, okay? Um, when you need legal services, pay for it, okay? Um, lawyers are expensive. I know they're expensive. Um, but to get the wrong legal advice or to think that you know something might end up being a heck of a lot worse than, um, than just paying an original 2000 Rand or something for a lawyer. Okay. Um, sometimes you can also ask your accountants. Um, we do have some, some commercial 
law background, but we are not qualified lawyers. Um, most accountants will tell you, listen, <laughs> no, can't help you here, or it's a contract, it's not that bad, or whatever the case may be. Okay. Um, Lee and Taryn, I think that is me. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Christelle. Certainly very, very informative. I uh, share Eric says, Eric says his uh, sentiments, and I'm sure everybody else who's part of the Zoom as well. It was amazing. Thank you very much. Lots to think about there. And of course, um, that lovely summary slide at the end with your patkos. You call it, take, <laughs> you call it a takeaway. I call it a patkos. Or a patkos. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So let's go ahead um, and just look at some questions quickly. And I'm going to ask Lorraine. The first question is from Lorraine Beaton. Um, and it was about, she was interested in how artists pay tax. Um, she says they pay each production com company's tax separately. So how would this then impact artists? Okay. Um, actually pretty easy. Um, I've done a couple of presentations to artists as well because artists don't always realize um, how they've got it so bad while they're working and they are so in the pound seat when it comes to tax season and then they don't file their tax and I can go, ah, you have no idea what you're missing out on. Anyway, um, yes, because of the 25% rule, actors um, get the, the majority of actors or the, the guys who do it right get deducts the 25% from the salaries and issue the RP5 end of the year. Now this guy has worked on 10 productions for the year, okay, or 10 different things for the year. Um, when you do the tax return, all 10 of those RP5s should be on his tax return, all right? Um, if you've got a very on top um, agent, mm -hmm. The agent will actually give me a breakdown to say to me, but he didn't work on 10 productions. He worked on 27. The other 17 weren't taxed. There's the rest of it. Okay. And I can fill in the gaps. But um, basically, we put together, because any individual is taxed on their worldwide income. So you put together all of the, all of the incomes, all right? And then we determine a, a taxable income. And then whatever pays you earn has been deducted gets taken into account and then usually because of the 25 percent being too much okay there's usually a refund due to them also because of the code 3616 that needs to be on their rp5s because they are independent contractors they get to deduct expenses because they are running a business essentially so that will make that taxable amount even less so if you've got actors guys this is not a, a business pitch but send them my way because they don't know much of don't know how much money they can actually get back from SARS at the end of the day. Okay. Like I say, it's, it's hard times during tax, you know, while they're working, but they have to file. They absolutely have to file. They get so much money back. It's, it's scary. Okay. Okay. Lorraine, I see you do. It seems like you do want to just expand a little bit more. Can I ask you to put your, um, your mic on and you can. Hi. Perhaps introduce yourself, where you're from, and so on. Um, yeah, thank you. My name is Lorraine. I um, I live in Pretoria, and we don't really have any agencies here, so I've been toying with this idea of of doing something about that. Um, I just think, yeah, I, I, um, part of what the agent does is probably help the artists understand how their tax works and to actually you know, process it or, or help them. And I'm just a bit nervous about that. But it sounds like it's more advice and um, and just sort of getting things in order and then somebody else like you would then actually do the okay. filing. <laughs> okay, yeah. So what happens is, remember, you can't file on behalf of another person unless you are a tax practitioner, all right? So okay. um, you can advise them, but only in as far as you know, Okay. And that's why usually, I must be honest with you, my clients with agencies usually tell their actors to just come to me. Like I say, not a not a sales pitch. They can go to their own tax practitioner. It's all fine. But um, it's, it's imperative that they speak to somebody who knows that they can actually claim and what they can claim for. Okay. Because um, there's, like I say, they, they are a special type of taxpayer and um, it costs them a bit of money. But um, I've, I've submitted a tax return today for a guy, 93,000 rand refund. It's 
Nothing funny. Standard. Wow. So, yeah. Um, when it comes to, I'll, I'll just read your question here, and it says, who is responsible? Oh, no, sorry. Um, how the, oh, forgot it's a touch screen. <laughs> You don't have to figure it all out and put it under one RP5. No, you don't have to. And um, that would actually be the best and easiest way to deal with it with SARS. But um, no, you don't. Okay. The the best that I can advise you to have right or to to assist your um your actors is to even if you run it like on an Excel kind of thing. If you can tell every actor at the end of the financial year on which productions they worked. And what were charged. So usually how it works is um, you've got a billing schedule, you know, like a, a little per month invoice in Excel. So um, it was for Prime Media, invoice one to three was for 10,000 Rand, of which 7,000 Rand went to the actor and they deducted 1,000 Rand or whatever. That line item was for Billy Bob. And you can put all of Billy Bob's invoices together for Billy Bob once a year. That makes it so much easier. Come. Okay. Thanks. That sounds easy enough. Okay. Okay. So we're going to move on then to Tandile, who's joining us all the way from the UK in Birmingham. And okay. he's got a question around generating IRP5s. Tandile, do you want to put your mic and your camera on and go ahead? Um, hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm actually experiencing some um, network issues. The side, funny enough. Um, my question, actually, which I posed on the chat earlier on, was that around the IRP5 and pairs you earn, right? You mentioned that um, the, sorry, you guys can hear me, right? Yes, yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> okay, okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, it was just too quiet for a second. <laughs> um, w- was was that um, the, oh, gosh. Let me try and get the question now because it was. Um, Tandile, I've got it here yes. on the screen. I can see okay, it. Okay, cool. Okay. So if I can jump in so you can tell me if I haven't answered your question yes, correctly. Yes, yes. All right. Who's yes, responsible yes. to generate the RP5 form for the artist? So yes. an RP5 is issued by the company who deducted the pay as you earn on behalf of the employer, um, employee. Sorry. Mm-hmm. So it would be, it will have to be um, generated by the production house. Okay. Not by you. All right. And then how will the pay as you earn be tracked in the case where a production house does not pay the 20, 25% to SARS? That's difficult. So in the example, I just gave Lorraine where you've got, um, Mm. Billy Bob, and you now have five different productions. Three of them deducted pay as you earn and two didn't. Okay. The three of them, okay. Um, for your actor, you should, if you give your actor that little spreadsheet, technically the actor should see that company A, B, and C deducted pay as you earn. So they should be RP5s from company A, B, and C. Okay. If there's Mm -hmm. not an RP5 from company C, now we need to investigate. Did company C not give the RP5 to SARS? Did they not pay the pay as you earn to to, to SARS? Well, what's going on? Does company C still exist? Okay. So that it becomes quite a bit of a, of a juggle. Mm -hmm. And, um, I've got a I've I've got a couple of of very on the ball agents who actually sit and go through all of this for all their agents every single year and get all of the RP fives and make sure that they do this. But I mean, it's not it's not two days worth of work. It is a crap mm. worth, worth of work. Mm. So um, that's why I'm saying, you know, if <laughs> I, I'm not allowed to encourage it because it's against the law. <laughs> but if you yeah. get a hundred percent, you know, it's actually better. <laughs> so yeah, but um. It's it's difficult. It's it's not easy. And the thing is, you won't know about that twenty five percent until off until tax season, basically. So mm. if your if your um, artist does a job in April, he's going only going to find out next year July. Mm. Mm. If, if and and may I ask? So, sorry, follow up question. You which you've yes. answered the first one perfectly. Um, mm. When do um, you know companies, the production companies, file the um, 25% to SARS because I'm now okay. thinking right as an artist right and um, 
the 25% is only picked up towards the end of the following year or the beginning mm. of the following year and you did this work at the beginning of the, the previous financial year, um, how do you even, you know, um, exactly. check that? Yeah. So that's why I say the easiest way for me to check to check that is if you as an artist can receive that little um, Excel sheet and basically give a breakdown of all the work that you've done for the year mm. with the art with the, from your from your agent and then double check that you've got all of those IRP fives received from um, the production houses. But to answer your question, when do they file? Um, they've got to pay over the pays you earn every month to SARS. So if you okay. shoot, if, if your shoot or your production, your soap your whatever was running in July to September. Okay. They should have made payments in August, in September, in October. All right. Mm, for mm. SARS. But then you will only get your RP5 after February of the next year. So filing C or the, the, the reconciliation season for um, 501s only open if we have a financial. Okay. So we are in the 2022 financial year now, which will end February 2022 from the 1st of April 2022 till the end of May 2022 the companies have an opportunity, not the opportunity, the liability, to now start filing those IRP5s and their reconciliations. Then SARS has a, a system update period in July, oh, sorry, in June, and then from the 1st of July, tax season opens. So from the 1st of July, we can see what RP 5 lies against the actor's name. But it's a, mm. it's a tricky one. So mm. that's why I also say make sure that your actors have got a, an accountant or a tax practitioner who knows how to track these things and to make sure what money where. You know, it's... it's... So, yeah, okay. <laughs> so... No, I, I, I think it definitely puts, you know, the um, um, artist slash freelance industry in like a, like a back end um Absolutely. when it comes to tax returns Absolutely. and I, i'd like to know how much you know we contribute you know to that 70 percent of the collective tax to actually get sars mm -hmm. to perhaps change things for our industry yeah. Mm. um yeah i'm i'm not the right person to speak to i must be honest with you <laughs> yes, people yes, who yes. do that <laughs> You do those kind of breakdowns, but um, yeah, no, but I, I'm sure that SARS don't even realize how much money they're missing out on. So yeah, no, it's it's scary. I know the PMA has been fighting for a lot of years to to get the necessary recognition and stuff. I don't know if you're still on the line, but um, yeah, she can tell you about a couple of battles. <laughs> so yeah. All right, thank you so much. Okay, no worries. Thanks, Tandile. It is at six o'clock. I'm going to ask um, if we could please just extend by five minutes so that we can get through the last question and then just the closing by Taryn. Um, and then we'll do the quick draw. So we just need about five minutes. The last question is from Dear Vault. Dear Vault, if you would put your mic on, please, and go ahead and chat. Uh, Christelle's waving. I think she may know you. <laughs> Okay, so we've got a question from Diavolt. Please go ahead, Diavolt. I can see him. I can't hear him. Hello. I can see him. I can't hear him. <laughs> can you hear Hello. <laughs> Hello, Khaled. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Khaled. <laughs> Yes. Um, I can net gevra um wat ons dan self is laat ons moet betaal. Um moet daar kontrak wees of nie? Yourself. Ja. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, if you yeah. want to pay yourself a salary, do okay, you so need the a question is, if you want to pay yourself a salary, do you need a Okay. Thanks, dear Walt. Sorry that was um Echoing a bit. Anyway, um, okay, so again, a bit of a technicality there. Um, if you are the only shareholder and the only director of the company, who's going to dispute your salary? <laughs> um, nobody really. But if you are in a partnership, it's always best to get things in writing and um, have the uh, know what's going on. Just, just keep the air open between everybody. 
because you know partnerships guys have got a way of going bad very quickly without people you know you don't even know you're in a sinking ship and and then things go you don't even know you're in a so um Yes, if there's more than one person involved in the management and in in the shareholding of the company, definitely get a contract drawn up. But then you must also have a partnership agreement and all those like uh, legal stuff in there. Or I would strongly advise. But um, if it's just yourself, not 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 necessary. Okay. Okay, and then we've got Ayanda Shangoti. She's put her hand up. She's got a question. Ayanda, if you would mind, wouldn't mind unmuting, go ahead. Um, hi, I've unmuted, but I didn't put on my camera because it's gotten dark. Um, but whew, what a workshop. First of all, thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it's loaded, but it's it's so it's so liberating. I just want to say thank you so much, Crystal. Not and a problem. Glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> but I think my chest is burning because we have a legacy in our family where we've been doing something that agents and managers have been doing, but we've been doing it running as an NGO, and it's really made it so difficult for us. As, um, as the legacy to keep it going so that others can have the same chances of, of starting a, a, successful create, a successful career in the creative industry. So now I'm kind of curious of how to switch things. Maybe do, do we need to have an actual agent to make sure that we actually have a business that is making money so that the NGO can also be supported by that business or is there a way of, 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 of making this work out easier? I don't know, rather than starting from scratch. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to just um, sit down and just backtrack a little bit and see if you say that the NGO has been doing the same as the agencies, have they been um, scouting for, for work and offering the contracts and getting the, the access to then- the jobs, I, those kind I think, of things. I think not. Not I, thought, not. I think not everything, but the the, the main thing of actually um, finding the talent, but then training them and 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 reading them to be employable. But okay. then we find that many other aspiring artists don't get the same chance because we can't keep our organization going because we work from our own pockets. So mm-hmm. maybe it's high time that we just take it to the next level maybe and be an official ma- artist manager agency i don't know i'm just okay curious. so my first thought there is that to continue with the training and to continue the ngo activities in the ngo but yeah. you're going to have to register a separate company because uh, yeah. um, an ngo can't do profit okay yes, so you can't, can't do the tax and yeah. so you need a you'll need a separate entity to um to run the the artist um the agency activities through yes, but what yes, i would yes. do is i would actually as soon as you have found a um a briefing or something that your um actor can be sent to and they actually get the job to then charge them the commission through the agency and then you can start making the money through that side not giving oh, okay. up on your ngo um activities yeah. and yeah. the beauty the beauty that you sit with there is if you start making money in your normal um, agency, okay, yeah, you yeah. can make donations to your to NGO. To our NGO, yeah. Yes, and it'll because be a section funding is not always available. So we yes. end up using our own salaries to exactly. keep it alive. So are you guys registered for Section 18A to don- donations? Um, you mean the NGO? We yeah, are the, the NGO. Do you have Section 18A status? Uh, you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> because if you've got Section 18A status, then the deduction or the donations from your agency back to the NGO will be tax-free. So you'll get oh, a, a deduction in your agency and you'll have a tax-free receipt in your um, NGO. So I'll that'll fund out. the system. Yeah. So I'll it'll, yeah. But I mean, to register that is not... It shouldn't be a problem. You're already an NGO. That's usually more difficult to get than an 18A. So, okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you so much. This was so amazing. No worries. <laughs> okay. <Thank you. laughs>
Thanks so much, Ayanda. Um, there is a question from Maureen. Maureen, I've direct messaged you. If you wouldn't mind emailing me your question directly to lead.duhu at gmail.com. Maureen is wanting to know about how, as a new agency, you would get new artists to auditions. And I think that's more operational, Crystal. So um, we'll respond to you directly via email, Maureen, if you wouldn't mind getting in touch. Um, okay, right. Let's do the draw quickly and then move on to the uh, closing we're going to share the screen because we want to be uh, as fair and transparent as possible. And we're doing a little spin the wheel vibe here. So let's go ahead and spin and see who the lucky winner is. We will get in touch with you directly and share Crystal's details with you. It's one of the, okay. There we are. Newo Matomane is the winner of that consultation with MGL Accounting. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> Congratulations, Nawa. Um, I'll get in touch with you via email. I do have all of your details, so I'll email you um, all Christelle's details and you guys can schedule an appropriate time. All right, 100%. thanks, gonna hand Thank you. <laughs> Great. I'm going to hand over to Taryn, um, who's going to, to do the closing. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to firstly say thank you to SASFED, who is the, they are the South African Screen Federation, who helped us uh, with our application to SASI, which is the South African Screen Sector Support Initiative. I want to say thank you to our admin project, Guru Lee Duru, and her friend, uh, Yaku Hall, who's come onto the call. And uh, I love that spin the wheel vibe. I, I think that's amazing. And then to Margie and Christelle, um, I have a disclaimer. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to advertise for you because you aren't our accountants and, uh, and our bookkeeping service. So I can say this quite clearly. Um, every time I speak to one of the agencies that you that you look after, they say, oh, let me just quickly ask Crystal. So your name has been going around for a very long time. Uh, and I am so, so grateful from the bottom, bottom, bottom of my heart. I wish in 1996, when we started our agency, we could have had you and Margie as our consultants. I think a lot of lessons we learned, we learned the very hard way. Um, for those of you who's starting an agency, reach out to the PMA. We'll be able to tell you if you want to join us how to do all of that. But this presentation, ladies and gentlemen, is gold. Keep it in a very, very safe place. Christelle, thank you. Margie, thank you. And uh, we hope to see you all soon at the next um, presentation. This project is meant for agents, for aspiring agents, emerging agents, for capacity building, uh, and those people who are agents already. So thank you very much for your time, and thank you for being with us tonight. We're, today, we appreciate it hugely. Lee, over to you. Yes, thanks, Taryn. Um, I just wanted to, as a quick parting shot, to remind everyone to please complete the survey. I have put the link up several times in the chat. You can just copy that link and complete the survey or just click on it directly rather. It'll uh, redirect you straight to the survey. And also just to remind you, if you may have missed it, the recording of this presentation as well as the soft copy will be available on the PMA website as well as the SA Guild of Actors website in about a week's time. So you can go ahead and check that out so that you can have it as um, a reference that you can constantly go back to. Thank you.